Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles. This is Len Edgerly on April 24th, 2020. <music> Greetings from Ocean Park, Maine, where we have been staying in place for well over a month now, and it's pretty much the same as ever, although we have some We had some snow, had some crazy weather here in the past week or so, and it's unusually cold for this time of year. My guest this week is A.G. Riddle, a novelist who has written about pandemics, and he's been a good source of information for us. He's been on twice before, once in February, once in March, so I invited him back for an update of how he sees the coronavirus pandemic proceeding from here. And we also talk specifically about some of the things that Amazon is doing in the midst of it. I hope you'll find that interesting. And in the news, I have a device to talk about. That's something we don't always have these days, but it's a new e-ink device. And I ordered one, which will be here in July. So I'll tell you about that as well. The first three news items that I want to talk to you about all have to do with Amazon's dealing with the coronavirus and specifically the role of Jeff Bezos. And I'll start with the New York Times piece that ran April 22nd by Karen Weiss, W-E-I-S-E. And it was, the theme of it was that Bezos has been somewhat separate from the day-to-day running of Amazon. He's had lots of other activities having to do with climate change and Blue Origin uh, Rocket. He's got a a new romance that takes him around the world and (laughs) uh, engaging places. But all of a sudden now he is back uh, helping Amazon day-to-day deal with the coronavirus. And this story says that he makes daily calls to help make decisions about inventory and testing, as well as how and when down to the minute Amazon responds to public criticism. Uh, The article quotes Jay Carney, who is the top spokesman for Amazon, saying that Bezos has been, quote, incredibly focused on this, meaning the coronavirus, and is participating in and driving our leadership meetings for the response to the pandemic. That was a quote that he uh, gave an interview in uh, end of March, March 31st. Uh, This New York Times article uh, quotes three different sources, uh, they're anonymous to speak uh, candidly, uh, saying that Bezos and other executives approved plans to stop accepting lower priority items into the warehouses and to delay shipments of other items considered low demand. I think that stuff had all been made public beforehand. uh, And that Jeff Bezos personally approved the delay of Prime Day, which would otherwise be coming up in July, but that has been delayed, I think, indefinitely. I'm not sure if there's a new date for it. Uh, Jay Carney said that testing has animated Bezos. Uh, The question that he's posing is, how do we get to a point where tests are available on demand, where results are as close to instant as possible? Uh, When I see the issue framed that way, uh, it recalls, times when Bezos has stepped into a new product like the Kindle. You know, when the fir- when the Kindle first came out, uh, was in the planning f- phase more than 12 years ago, he wanted it to be a device that you could download a book wirelessly to and instantly in less than 60 seconds. And at the time, it seemed crazy. It was uh, the engineers had to really struggle to even imagine that the e-readers at that time were connected to a computer and you download it from the computer. And the idea that you would have on-demand 3G and do this was, was really bold. But it's the way Bezos has thought about things that Amazon has done. So it doesn't surprise me that when he thinks about what needs to happen next to coronavirus, he, he lists the challenge in a very clear way. Uh, we've got to have a test available. It's got to be on demand, and the results need to be uh, almost instantaneous. And, and that's clearly the marching orders, uh, which is how Jay Carney was describing it. And we'll get some more information about what's going on from Jeff's letter to shareholders, which was released on April 16th. And uh, there's another piece in uh, Jay Carney did an interview with uh, Brian Stelter at CNN. This one was in March 29th. Uh, Some of the same 
issues about how Amazon is dealing with the coronavirus from the point of view of customers and of employees and the, uh, talking about the daily planning meetings with Bezos. Uh, and there's also, I'm going to play you some of that uh, interview because it gives a, it gives a sense of obviously how all in the company is on dealing with uh, this crisis. And uh, as is said in the letter to shareholders, Amazon is providing some, an essential service in getting uh, materials to people that they need. And we have things just showing up here at uh, Ocean Park. It, it, it still sort of surprises me. Every time a FedEx truck or a UPS truck or the post office drives up with something that we've ordered, I've, I've this is my hay fever season, so I ordered some Claritin, and sure enough, it just comes to the door. It's it's pretty astounding to think that uh, in the midst of protecting workers, they're able to still make all of these things happen. And, of course, Whole Foods is a important part of it for, for handling food. Um, it is part of the New York Times story. They picked up a purloined memo that was first uh, picked up by Vice. Uh, that's another media outlet. And <laughs> a tough day for Amazon General Counsel David Zapolsky because uh, he's quoted in some meeting notes of a planning session uh, casting aspersions on uh, someone who I think has been organizing at Amazon but they thought had been returning to a job site even though that he, they had been exposed to coronavirus. A, a messy, sticky problem, and this guy made some qu quotes that really looked pretty terrible when they were reported in Vice and then picked up by the New York Times. Uh, it, it's it's uh, The stress has got to be pretty high, and he, he explained that he had spoken in, in stress, and he obviously regretted what he had said. Uh, Let's uh, let's hear from Jay Carney. I, I'm going to begin uh, split it into two parts. It's a six minute clip, and uh, there's a lot of information here, which I think if you're following the company and you're wondering uh, what's what's happening regarding the coronavirus, you'll you'll find it interesting. I think it's probably still current, even though this was recorded almost a month ago. Joining me now is Amazon Senior Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs, Jay Carney. Jay, Amazon announced 100,000 uh, new hires in order to keep up with the surge of online orders. How many people have been hired so far? Well, I, I know, Brian, that we received uh, an unbelievable number of applications in just the first 24 hours, something on the order of 50,000. Uh, so I'm not sure in the process right now uh, how close we are to filling those slots, but I know we're moving very quickly. Does Amazon seem like a public utility to you at this point? I know that conjures up regulatory issues, but <laughs> does it feel that way to you at all? Well, it feels like we are uh, essential to so many Americans, uh, millions and millions around the country who are depending on uh, Amazon and other services like it to deliver things that they might otherwise have felt comfortable getting at a physical store. Now, yeah. I mean, as, yeah. you know, Amazon's a big e-commerce company, but, you know, E-commerce is still only about 10 or 11 percent of retail. In this time period during this crisis, I think more people are relying on home delivery, getting stuff at their doorstep. And that's why we've had to uh, call on our employees to just do heroic uh, things, to work really mm -hmm. hard, to, to add hours and, and then to hire more just to get uh, Americans what they need. Yeah, you know, after Superstorm Sandy here in New York, there were gas lines. These days, there are food lines. I drove by four different Whole Foods. Uh, Amazon now owns Whole Foods, and there were lines outside all of them. And when I went inside one of the Whole Foods, most of the people were actually workers. They were carting up supplies, bringing groceries to people's homes. That leads me to a question from Dave on Twitter. He says, what is Amazon doing to help its frontline workers at distribution centers and Whole Foods stores? What are you providing workers for safety? Well, it's a great question because this is our first and primary concern, which is making sure that our uh, Amazon employees, you know, 500,000 plus in the United States are as protected as they can be as they go about uh, doing this heroic work for uh, their fellow citizens. And, for, you know, we have instituted, uh, you know, extraordinary measures in our fulfillment centers around social distancing, around uh, extra deep cleaning of facilities, touch screens, uh, other surfaces, uh, making sure that there's no a congregation uh, that brings employees together and too close together uh, for any period of time. Uh, and we've also uh, 
in addition to raising pay uh, if, uh, during this period, up to $17 an hour minimum, not up to, but beginning at $17 an hour minimum, which is well more than twice the federal minimum wage, we've offered extended benefits, an additional uh, two weeks of paid time off if you're uh, presumed to have or diagnosed with COVID, or if you have to go home to take care of a family member who has COVID-19. So uh, we've also mm-hmm. told employees, if, if they're uncomfortable coming to work, if, if, if they're worried about their own health, uh, they can take unlimited uh, uh, unpaid time off through the end of April with no repercussions at all. We don't want anyone to feel like their job depends on coming to work in this circumstance. Jay Carney goes on to talk about how difficult it is to get masks and how the millions of masks that Amazon was trying to get, most of them at that point back in late May, they, March, they were making them available to frontline health workers and others and then waiting to have them available for employees as well. Uh, he also talks about this daily meeting that's that's referred to in the New York Times piece uh, and uh, also <laughs> addresses the questions about President Trump's uh, relationship with Bezos in, in this situation. We have a daily meeting in, uh, with our leadership, including Jeff Bezos, the CEO, where uh, while we, we go over sort of the update on what's happening around the world with our employees and with our customers and our businesses, we also spend a significant amount of time just brainstorming about what else we can do, yeah. uh, what novel. You mentioned Bezos. President Trump and Bezos have, uh, have had a bad relationship. Is that affecting Amazon right now? Do you need things from the federal government right now? We are working cooperatively with the administration and, and in fact, have, notwithstanding some of the uh, you know, comments we've seen from the president about Amazon, I think that are mostly uh, uh, directed or, or, or uh, generated because of his unhappiness with The Washington Post, which is not an Amazon property, but that Jeff owns. I think that, uh, you know, I know that my team is uh, plugged in. Uh, throughout the administration, Jeff himself has been uh, on a phone call with uh, President Trump, where President Trump uh, 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 said how much he appreciated what Amazon is doing, both uh, on the front lines and getting goods to Americans, and also by hiring at a time when so many companies are having to lay workers off. So uh, we're, we're happy with the cooperation we've got. Good to hear. Jay, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. The third piece of information about Amazon's role in the corona virus comes from uh, Bezos's letter to shareholders uh, uh, April 16th. Uh, and he notes that they've tempor- temporarily closed Amazon Books, Amazon four-star stores, and pop-up stores because they don't sell essential products, and associates in those stores have been offered jobs in other parts of Amazon. That's something I hadn't seen before. Uh, he mentions the more than 150 process changes that have been made to help teams in the warehouses stay safe. Uh, he said a next step in protecting our employees might be regular testing of all Amazonians, including those showing no symptoms. Uh, and he goes on to say, if every person could be tested regularly, it would make a huge difference in how we fight this virus. Those who test positive could be quarantined and cared for, and everyone who tests negative could reenter the economy with confidence. Uh, he's assembled a team, and the letter states that this team comprises research scientists, program managers, procurement specialists, and software engineers. These are people that have been taken away from their day jobs and put on a dedicated team team to work on testing. And at the time of the letter, uh, he said that they had begun assembling equipment for the first lab to uh, create tests. Uh, he says, we are not sure how far we will get in the relevant time frame, but we think it's worth trying and we stand ready to share anything we learn. Uh, you, you've probably heard by now that Amazon has raised uh, its minimum wage. Uh, it's gone up $2 an hour to $17 an hour. Uh, this also says they're paying double regular rate for overtime. And that's a minimum of $34 an hour. The previous overtime rate was a time and a half, which is more standard. And I hadn't seen this before. The, the wage increases that uh, are talked about here are going to cost more than $500 million just through April, and if they continue through the uh, rest of the year, which I'm sure they will, uh, that's going to be an even even bigger number. I I had noticed that uh, in the hiring 
uh, position. They had said uh, they really hope to hire people in these 175,000 new jobs at Amazon that have lost jobs because of the pandemic in other areas. And the letter has a, a couple of uh, individual examples which put a face to it. He says, we've welcomed Joe Duffy, who joined after losing his job as a mechanic at Newark, Air- Newark Airport and learned about an opening from a friend who is an Amazon uh, operations analyst. Uh, also, Dallas preschool teacher Darby Griffin joined after her school closed on March 9th and now helps manage a new inventory. We're happy to have Darby with us until she can return to the classroom. The letter closes with a quote from Dr. Seuss, Theodore Seuss Geisel. When something bad happens, you have three choices. You can either let it define you, let it destroy you, or you can let it strengthen you. I am very optimistic about which of these civilization is going to choose, Jeff writes. Even in these circumstances, it remains day one. As always, I attach a copy of our original 1997 letter. Well, in the the long uh, chain of these letters each year, this is certainly one that stands out as unique. Uh, The focus is entirely on coronavirus, although there's a lot of information about uh, climate change initiatives in the second half of it as well. I, I, I like uh, I like Jay Carney's response to questions which come up, and I like how Amazon's getting the word out on what they're doing. Uh, it's I think they're doing things because they think they're the right things to do, uh, and getting that information out uh, is I don't think it taints these things. It puts them oh you're just doing this to uh, you know make friends and avoid regulation by the government. Uh, but if you're going to be doing significant things, I think you owe it to the team and you owe it to customers and you owe it to people that believe in the company to let them know uh, what's happening in this environment. And so I think these three points of information on that have uh, been worth spending some time with. Now, hardware news. Michael Kozlowski, uh, who does Good E-Reader, that's a blog, uh, really, he's, he's developed into, uh, I think, a definitive voice on everything that's happening in the, in the area of hardware for e-readers. So he has uh, followed the news that on April 21st, uh, Pocketbook uh, re- is going to release a, a color uh, e-ink reader. It's going to be the Pocketbook Color. It's going to be available for $215, a six-inch display, and there's a video of it. I'll have a link to it. it the color looks pretty good. You know, it's, it's not as bright as the iPad that I'm looking at here, but it's e-ink, and the color can be used to highlight books. And uh, I, 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 It's been so long since uh, I was last excited about the idea of color e-ink that it, it, it surprises me that I, I'm sort of ho-hum about this. But I am interested enough to see what it looks like that I pre-ordered uh, one of these pocketbook colors from Michael's uh, website, and uh, I think it'll be here sometime in June. There are two other companies that are doing color e-ink in China, uh, and there was one, uh, I think Pocketbook released one in 2013 based on e-ink Triton, which was a Michael calls a primitive version of the color e-ink. Garrett Riley wrote me wondering... Color on an oasis? Well, possibly. You know, I think the cost of this is certainly uh, not going to be suitable to the basic Kindle or even the Paperwhite. But if you've got a premium product at the high end, the oasis, and there's a way to have color be an option, I think that's probably. Uh, uh, I won't be surprised if if that uh, is in our future. But by July, I should be able to hold one of these in the hand and be out reading on the beach if I'm allowed on the beach and tell you. What does it look like to read an ebook with an e-ink screen and, and see some color in it? Time now for the interview. A.G. Riddle, the author of Nine Thrillers, which draw heavily on the author's passion for science, has been keeping us up to date on the coronavirus since we first spoke about it on February 15th. That was in TKC 603. That seems like a long time ago indeed. Uh, Jerry and I visited again on March 11th, and a lot has happened since that date also. Uh, We spoke by Zoom. He was at home in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was here at Ocean Park, Maine. That was on Wednesday, April 22nd. Here's our conversation. We talked last on March 11th, which was uh, 42 days ago. And it's, it's instructive to look at the numbers because on that day, 
uh, worldwide, the reported number of cases of coronavirus was 130,000. Now it's 2.6 million. Wow. And on March 11th in the U.S., the number of cases was 1,039. Today it's 834,854. Wow. And the deaths, uh, worldwide deaths, stand at 181,235, including 45,895 in the U.S. Uh, you know, with that as kind of the, the numerical context, uh, when you think of this past little over a month, 42 days, compared with what you expected would be the rollout of this coronavirus worldwide and in the U.S., what what has surprised you most uh, in this recent period? Well, certainly the um, the growth of cases in the U.S. I mean, I guess, you know, the thing that I didn't, didn't know uh, was what was being done behind the scenes to prepare. I mean, my, you know, in February when we talked, I, you know, my feeling was that there was going to be a significant outbreak in the U.S. and that, you know, that it would get under control after some time. I think yeah, you know, there are two things that are, that drive the course of a pandemic. I mean, one is you know, how contagious is this pathogen, and um, how deadly is it? And so, for coronavirus, the the thing that is extremely problematic is how contagious it is. I mean, once you know the 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 R naught of the virus, I mean that everything else becomes um, just a matter of time. I mean, the the other thing that's really that I think has driven a lot of this is this long asymptomatic period where people are contagious. And so you got people walking around who have the virus, they don't know it, they're spreading it. And then this thing is surviving for, you know, 24 hours on cardboard and then maybe up to three days on plastic and metal. And so these are not really things you can deal with, but you know, there's a lot you can do, right? Like you can ramp up your hospital capacity, you can get PPE, you can, you know, start testing to to um, to look for these super spreader events, and I think there's been a lot of those you know big time spreading events, especially in urban areas, and a lot of um, so in that respect, a lot of surprises from my perspective. Like, you know, if you look at the number of cases, you know, and I think it's also instructive when we when you talk about well, the U.S. has this many cases and Spain has this many cases and. Belgium has this many cases. It's like how many cases per capita? What's the death rate per capita? Um, I think perspective in a time like this is is really important. But the U.S. has far more cases than than I was anticipating at this point. Yeah, we've got. I think Spain is the second most cases, and obviously it's a much smaller country. But when you look at China and India, both with more than a billion people, and we're at three hundred and thirty million, and they're China's cases, I think there's some question about the reliability of some of the numbers out of China, but 83,000 in China, 20,000 in India compared with uh, 834,000 in the U.S., a third the size of those two countries. I mean, how can we understand that disparity? Gosh, it's going to be hard with science. I, like the number of cases in China, if that is true, then you know what they've done is I don't know. I mean, it's on the edge of possibility. Like, I, it, there's just simply no way there aren't many, many more cases in in China, especially the the fact that it originated in China. I just, um, I'm very uh, skeptical of those numbers, and I'm also very surprised there aren't more cases. And in India has a ton of urban density in certain places, and those are the that's what drives a lot of this um, bunch of unrecognized cases in an urban setting with, you know, it's not so much a problem for guys like me who work from home and aren't out a lot, but, you know, baristas at coffee shop that have undiagnosed COVID is, those are things that are hugely problematic, right? And, and somewhere in Mumbai right now, there are a bunch of baristas with COVID-19 undiagnosed, if I had to guess. But, yeah. Yeah. It's surprising. Is is it fair to consider it sort of a test of a country's or a society's functioning or uh, ability to handle challenges to, to compare how different countries are faring so far in the pandemic? You know, it is sort of, I mean, 
in some sense, it's a very interesting social event, um, a stress test, if you will, of societal functioning. Uh, I think it comes at kind of an inopportune time. I mean, there's, it feels like to me, well, first of all, I'll say that, you know, coronavirus, um, it, the mortality rate is not uh, as high as something like we talked about before, SARS and MERS, mercifully. I mean, I think that that is good news and things could be a lot worse. Um, but I do think, you know, the timing is not great because right now it feels like a lot of of what is on the news is filtered through preconceived notions or your your point of view, right? Like, and, and I think people are, you know, if a news outlet that, that leans the, the opposite direction of their own beliefs, I think they're very skeptical of anything they see, right? And, and some of that is really counterproductive to fighting an outbreak like this because it, because critical thinking is becoming a, a dying art. I mean, it's just no one, or it seems like there's less and less of that. And I, well, the other thing that I would say is that, you know, you need good data and, you, and I think a good healthy perspective. And, and it goes something like this. Like I have a lot of, uh, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I have a lot of family in the Western part of the state. They're well-educated, fairly affluent. Uh, they own, you know, small businesses and, you know, there, there aren't a ton of cases in rural North Carolina at this point. Like Wake County, I think we have about uh, 1.2 million people. And we, we only have like 600 cases. And we have had a couple dozen deaths or something. So it's not. And so, in the, you know, I talked to family members. They're like, hey, you know, this, is, this is wild. You know, we need to open up the, you know, just forget about all this. And I have to remind them, I was like, you know, you have to really look at some facts. And the facts are that they are storing dead bodies in refrigerated tractor trailers in New York city. And there's a tent hospital in central park. And I mean, that this is not something that's made up. I mean, this is a real event that's happening and it's, that could happen where you are, you know? And the reason that it happened there and it's not happening here is that they had much more cases earlier. They had those people walking around that were infected that no one knew about. And now we're taking action to make sure that we're not like them. That's what we're doing. We're not treating the situation that we have now. We're trying to prevent what might happen. And so I think it's like having some perspective, but at the same time, I try to keep perspective to think, well, you know, someone is sitting in their house right now watching their business that they built over their lifetime go down the drain. And that, I mean, I can't even imagine what that's like. And I mean, I think there's both sides. Um, but it's so right now, I feel like, you know, to your question, it is this test of society and in the sense of what is, you know, what are our, our beliefs and our values? And I think it has to be, to some extent, the greater good balanced with you know, what's right for your family and what, you know, what makes sense in your area. Right. You know, I think of World War Two and uh, my parents, they were teenagers in World War II, so it really affected them and the Depression. And their story is often, well, in World War II, we all pulled together. It was the greatest generation and, and not like this period of, of divisiveness. But my sense is that in World War II, uh, well, for one thing, my dad's parents hated Roosevelt, and they thought that when Roosevelt got elected that that was just the end of the nation. And, you know, the media maybe wasn't quite so polarized at that point, but there were deep divisions in the country in World, World War II, and eventually we rallied and mobilized, and, and there, was this, there was this kind of uniformity of uh, response that transcended the divisions. And I wonder if in this setting, we just haven't reached a point where reality has caught up with everyone on kind of an equal basis to where there's still the illusion that you can simply blame it on the other side and, and think it'll go away if only your side is given the power to make all the decisions. That's right. I mean, I, the context and the, I think the sort of zeitgeist of the United States is that I think there are some ideological divisions between rural areas and the cities. I think cities economically, you know, perhaps have outpaced what, what is happening in rural areas, you know, and I think they're, 
this sort of um, manifests itself on a variety of issues from immigration to, you know, take your pick. Um, and I think the fact that I, I do, I do feel that a lot of people in rural areas feel like in a sense, they're being left behind. Right. And you see it in the, uh, the 2016 election, you know, the, you can almost paint by numbers of, you know, the, here's the color of the cities and here's the, you know, the way people voted in rural areas. And I think, and I think the, the pandemic in a, in an interesting way has, um, to some extent laid that bare because, you know, the cities obviously are, have, have taken a much more outsized impact from the virus and, and will. And, um, and there's this sense of what we have to do to, you know, to provide for cities is, is perhaps not good for the rural areas. And there is some element of truth to that, certainly. But I think, I think that things do look different in another couple of months because, I mean, what I told some of my family members back home was that, you know, you, you are in a certain a time lapse experiment here. What you see on the news is the future and what is going to happen to you is going to be very similar to what you see there if things aren't done. And so when you know someone who gets COVID, things are going to feel a lot different. And those rural hospitals, frankly, are not as well prepared as the New York City hospital system. So if this happened in New York City, you know, you, you got to think really critically about whether you want to be sick there and and, and, if, and, and what it's worth to take some precautions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, but it's really, it's been here, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, I do like our family has taken a lot of precautions and, um, and we're very blessed. I mean, we're able to do it and, um, you know, thankful for it, you know, how, uh, are you, talk to me about masks when you're going out. Are you wearing masks and uh, some of the specifics of how you're taking care? Yeah, we do. I mean, we have, I don't, I think we only have a, a handful of N95 masks and they're, they're ones that we've used before. And um, my wife, when she went to the grocery store, she, you know, she wore the mask and um, we're building a new house now. So we have to wear the mask because they're drywalling in there. Yeah. So um, that's, that's really the, I mean, the only places we've gone are the grocery store and the new house. So, yeah. um, but we, yeah, we're wearing them and we're seeing a lot more of them too. My wife's uh, really, she's vigilant. I'll say that she's very vigilant and appropriately. So, you know, I'm, she's 60, I'm 69. She just doesn't want to go into a grocery store, even up here in Maine, where there's very few cases. But uh, if you go into a grocery store, uh, they're washing the carts, people are wearing masks. What What's your understanding of the risk of a, a very mindful, efficient trip to a, a grocery store to get supplies to last f for a week or two? Yeah, I, I think that it depends on where the grocery store is. So setting is important. A grocery store in San Francisco is a much higher risk profile than, say, Clayton, North Carolina, rural North Carolina. Right? Um, but I think the, the risk is not not huge, right? I mean, the, the virus uh, does survive on surfaces, but I think people are being vigilant. And I also think in context, um, the simple reality is for most people, you don't have a lot of other options. Right. And so I think, um, you know, what we do here is, you know, my wife, we had a lot of food before this started and, and, um, but, you know, when we get the stuff back from the grocery store, I think she'd been going every couple of weeks, we wipe it down with Clorox wipes because, um, it just makes sense. And then we do not let her, parents go to the grocery store which they're thrilled about but <laughs> yeah just simple precautions like that how about uh, packages that arrive from amazon and elsewhere what's your protocol for those sit on the front porch for yeah 24 hours and try to get some uv light on them and um yeah that's about it so uv light have you got a, a source of uv light that you can just shine on the packages 
I wish. Yeah. Just natural sunlight. Oh, I see sunlight. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I thought, boy, I, that labels me as a city guy. Yeah. Where would you get UV light? <laughs> there must be some, I can probably buy a gadget from Amazon to do that. It's right out here. Uh, in talking to different people in this period, we're all in slightly different settings. It's my wife and I and a puppy now. You've got you and your, your wife and you've got a, a young daughter. How, how old is she? Daughter. Three-year-old daughter. So it's the three of you have been living in close quarters now for a month or so. Uh, have you, you and your wife changed your daily routines or habits or adjusted? Uh, they must have been kind of well-established just because of your work and all. But what what have you learned about your family dynamics or yourself uh, in this kind of forced crucible of, I mean, this is something that I could imagine you setting as a, a plot for one of your novels that you're going to trap a, a, an otherwise normal couple and their daughter in, at, in their home and watch what happens for a month. But, but what does that story look like in, in reality? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, I talk about this with other writers. I mean, quarantine doesn't feel radically different than my normal life. <laughs> it's really weird, but I, you know, I'm a pretty intense introvert and I don't, don't particularly go out a lot. So I haven't missed much. I think my wife has suffered a great deal more. Our three-year-old, you know, she's young enough to, to where there's not a huge disruption. And, but it's been interesting. I mean, you know, our, our daughter is doing uh, these Zoom conference meetings with her preschool teachers and <laughs> preschoolers. It's something out of a science fiction movie, I guess. But yeah. Wild. But, it, you know, I do wonder... One of the things I've been surprised by is that, I mean, I think along with fighting a pandemic, there's all kinds of risk factors. And I mean, there's people who are intense extroverts who really need social interaction like people need medicine, you know, and I'm, I've been a little surprised that there hasn't been more uh, maybe guidelines from either state health departments or local about monitoring friends and family who, you know, either have depression or other mental health issues that can be exacerbated because those are, um, and, you know, people talk about it and say, hey, you know, if we don't end this uh, lockdown, you know, we're going to see X, Y, Z. But I don't see um, people saying these are the steps you need to take to help yeah. in your sphere. But, and I'm, you know, I've certainly seen more, I guess, uh, people reaching out online and making connections. And I think, I think, you know, one of the things you can do is be mindful about friends and family who might, you know, need a little more, you know, socialization from a distance if you can do yeah. as, as you look ahead to the summer and toward the fall to me it's a confusing landscape of maybe there'll be a second wave uh if we take our foot off the pedal too soon there could be bad consequences you know the economy versus the the health aspects what, what's your vision of the the next two months uh, given all of these uncertainties and, and I guess the, you know, if we all, if we had all the tests that we needed, it would look quite different, but we're managing under uncertainty, I guess, or lack of information. Yeah. I mean, look, if you ask me what I think the shape of things to come is, I, I think that it is more like if you took a basketball and you threw it across a room and you see it bounce, 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 and there's spikes and valleys and there's lower spikes. And, and the, um, the simple reality is that, you know, at some point there's going to have to be loosening of the guidelines for the obvious reason. I mean, the, the country unfortunately is not really set up to be in lockdown this long. Um, Yeah. But I think if you ask me what I think is going to happen is there's going to be loosening. And in some places, there'll be spikes in cases and then they'll retighten guidelines. And that almost becomes something that is localized more. I mean, nationally, we're kind of all in the same boat right now. And then I think some places that are able to can be more prudent and can lock down for longer and other places kind of. um, And then. I mean, there's there's two real similar events here. I mean, one is the introduction of a viable treatment, um, and that's going to help a lot, right? I mean, there's still going to be some people that 
unfortunately the treatment either you can't get it to them quick enough or it, it doesn't work for them but there's some good candidates out there uh, in particular one um there's a drug from Gilead called remdesivir is an antiviral used for about as a disclosure i own some stock in them a uh, small amount through a through my pension fund uh, anyway my retirement fund so there's that and then there's this anti-malaria drug um Plaquenil. But anyway, I, I think there's got to be, there's likely to be an antiviral that that could prove effective that that helps people a lot. Testing um, is something that's important, but there, there is limited utility in testing just because of the long asymptomatic period. So even, and, and I don't think large scale testing it takes resources and time and, and is it really practical? Um, you know, if you look at like Amazon's warehouses, they have a queue and they, they do a, um, you know, they shoot the temperature of people coming in. Now that's really effective. Like if someone has an active fever, their protocol is actually pretty good, I think. And I think, you know, that could be, if that was interest instituted at say, um, grocery stores in large urban areas. I mean, I think that probably makes some sense too, if you can do it. Um, and then the other sort of the end of this event is the introduction of a vaccine. And, and that will happen. I mean, it's, it's a matter of time. And I think it's important for people to realize that this does end. I mean, the vaccine, um, you, you really need it by Thanksgiving. You probably won't get it, but um, that would be the ideal date, um, assuming people cancel their summer vacations, which needs to, unfortunately needs to happen. But yeah, I mean, the treatment and then the vaccine are the two events that you look for. And in between that, I think you see spikes and valleys in cases and um, it's just going to be a grind. I've been interested to see some of the things that Amazon has been doing. They've got a uh, kind of a overview at their day one blog and one of the things they said is that they're assembling equipment to build a lab to process tests, and they hope to start testing numbers of frontline employees soon. Uh, is that a realistic goal? I mean, Amazon's huge, but if you were Jeff Bezos and you could throw resources at uh, coming up with your own test, uh, he also talks about uh, have assigned top machine learning technologists to capture opportunities in real time to improve social distancing at, at the uh, fulfillment centers. Uh, what kind of levers might he have to keep Amazon fulfilling this amazing uh, responsibility they've got to get people food and necessary supplies delivered to their door, even in the midst of this? I was really impressed that they're building a lab. I mean, it's not a, you know, not exactly a weekend project. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, I assume they have Quest or Lab Core. Somebody's going to help uh, run it. But I think I, I think it's a good idea. And you know, if they can do it, um, uh, and then run those tests with some accuracy, I, I think it's fantastic. The like I said, the you know, the big problem is that you know, testing everybody does take time and resources. And then you got that long asymptomatic period. So I think, you know, in my mind, the greatest thing is prevention and those, you know, social distancing. And what you, what you really need is a wipe down robot that's coming around all the time, spraying things down or wiping me. That's, yeah, that's probably harder to build than a lab, but, but maybe that's something that comes out of this. I mean, what, what I sort of hope is that we change, you know, we raise the awareness of the population of we, we are really in danger and this is not a danger that's going away. World War II was something that ended and there was a change, but we haven't had any more wars in Europe after that, right? Everyone was pretty well done with it. And, you know, I don't, this is not going to have the same sort of psychological impact, but I do hope people become more aware and we say, Hey, you know, um, maybe investing in a wipe down robot or some other procedures that keep us all safe you know, worth doing. And I think a year ago, if you were saying to somebody, I think we really need these robots that go around and spray down, you know, coffee shops, someone would look at you like you're crazy. Like, you know, that's, that's not really, but now everybody's been at home for a month and they're like, bring it on. Like if that allows me to go about my life, that, that probably sounds pretty good. Do you think that we might not be shaking hands on the other side of this when we greet each other? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it almost becomes a generational thing. I, mean, I think there's some some people who will still insist on him, but there's probably people on the other side of this that says, you know what, let's just forget it. Yeah, let's bow to each other. Yeah, that's right. Fist bump becomes the norm. How about the economy? Uh, you know, you, you see references to a Great Depression and 30% unemployment. That That's a, a part of it I have trouble imagining and envisioning. It sounds extremely dire to the point of, really threatening the fabric of the society and uh, you know, great depression. Uh, it, it's hard to even consider what those two words might look like in 2020 or 2021. But what, when you let your novelist's eye roll forward on that dimension, what kinds of things do you see? I mean, it's something I've thought of a, a good bit. Um, you know, the, so some, if you ask me what I think is going to happen is th- these sort of events, these black swan events, tend to accelerate already inevitable events. So, you know, you had industries that were rather fragile before and probably the writing was on the wall, but they might have had three years or five years. And now they have months or weeks to, to arrange financing. And the and the banks are saying, look, you know, um, just just can't do it so i think i think that is going to happen um i think the economy comes back because i think um i mean some of these narratives that i see about the economy really booming after this it would certainly be some pent-up demand but if you haven't been going to the cheesecake factory for six months you can't eat six months of cheesecake factory <laughs> meals in a week right well it's, it's kind of fun to burn. imagine yeah right right um <laughs> So, you know, you, I don't think there's recapture on a lot of economic activity that's been lost. But but I also think that where you lose some activity, it goes other. I mean, if you look at, you know, Costco and, and Walmart and Amazon, they, they certainly, if you're not eating Cheesecake Factory, maybe you're eating a frozen pizza at home which yeah. is made by someone somewhere. So I, my... Um, I, I'm not as, I mean, I'm a post-apocalyptic author, so I see the, you know, see the world through a certain lens, but I'm not that pessimistic. With that being said, I think there are a lot of jobs that I do not think are coming back, and I think it will take a lot of time um, to to get back to where we were, and maybe more time than people think. I don't, I don't particularly think this thing is V-shaped, and I think the U looks pretty long. Um, and, I, and I think some of that was is not all down to COVID nineteen. I think there were issues before where we were very, in my view, late in the economic cycle, and it had been the Federal Reserve and some you know other sort of um, you know the tax cuts and other actions had sort of prolonged the economic um, cycle. And I never think that's healthy. I mean, I think. To some extent, my 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 economist view is that you take your lumps, and you know if you the economic cycle has really become a credit cycle, and at the end of them, people start getting really loose with their lending, um, and they make bad loans just to sort of you know increase uh, their profits. And so I think at some point, if you can get those to roll off, you you make the economy stronger. And so I don't know, I'm, I don't, I'm not someone who believes that the, this was the strongest economy in human history before this started. I think it was, you know, had some structural problems, but, but I think we get over it and I think it just takes time and, you know, faith, but you know, the, the American economy, the American economy is made up of a group of Americans that believe in creating a better life for their family. And that, yeah. that's what has driven this nation and that's not going away. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I lived in Wyoming for 20 years and there was an intriguing profile of uh, kind of the politics of the pandemic in Wyoming. And it seemed to be a mix of people doing the right thing, people staying home and, and acting just the, the way they they do everywhere else. But having a real cowboy mentality about, I don't want the government forcing me to do this or that, you know? And, and I, I I guess I took hope from it that you you could probably portray a neighborhood in San Francisco 
and one in Cody, Wyoming. And if you listen to people deeply enough, yes, you would find ideological differences that play out ad nauseum, but that their fundamental ability to be resilient in the face of something like this and, and to be fairly smart about how to keep their family alive and how to, you know, keep their, their community going. Uh, but, uh, and I, I don't know, it may be that my Wyoming experience sort of echoes some of what you were saying about the rural parts of North Carolina and talking to your family about these things that it sounds like eventually they listen to you maybe more than they would the New York times or the Washington post. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I also think they're a bit, they're a bit predisposed to do the opposite of what those you know, the authorities are telling them. There's a certain mentality of you don't tell me what to do. And, yeah. you know, and I think like, you know, for example, my family owns a small textile mill and they, you know, it's a, it's an old business. It was affected by NAFTA a great deal. And it's adapted. Like they sell online direct to customers and they have a, a really good business. And hmm. There's a, I think, 20 people that work in the, um, in the small manufacturing plant. They sew these rugs, and so they're already they're social distance. These people are like 20 or 30 feet away, and they don't have a lot of interaction with each other. But we shut down when North Carolina shut down, and um, and what happened is all the sewers, I mean, some of them got on unemployment, but they were texting and calling saying we want to go back to work and so it wasn't just the business i mean i think the average person wants uh you know life to go back to normal and they're worried about providing for their family they, right. everybody's trying to make smart decisions but um i think they're you know i think it's easy for i think it's easy for a lot of people that are reasonably financially secure and work from home this is, this is the situation i'm in and it's but when I hear from other people, and I think, well, you know, that does make sense. I mean, if you're living paycheck to paycheck and unemployment is not going to be here and this stimulus or whatever from the government is not going to be here for a while, that's what you worry about. Right. You don't have a choice but to go to the grocery store. So in the grocery store, if the grocery store is more dangerous than your workplace, obviously you want to go to work. You know? yeah. So yeah. I do. I mean, it's, it does give me a lot of perspective on it. But Yeah, these are... It's a teachable moment for all of us, I, I, I hope. <laughs> I've been speaking with A.G. Riddle, author of Pandemic and other science-based thrillers. Thanks very much, Jerry. Stay safe. You too. Thank you for having me. That's it for this week. I hope you found this uh, conversation with Jerry interesting. And I also want to thank those of you who are following along on my morning journal flash briefing for Alexa. I usually put it up around 6.30 Eastern time. I think there's a little bit of a delay before it gets distributed to the whole Alexa network. It's just in the U.S. at this point. But by oh, 7 or 7.30, it should be up and available, about a four or five minute observation about what's going on here at Ocean Park in the midst of the pandemic. I, I realize I'm sort of building uh, an audio journal that I'll be saving in the Amazon cloud. So in future years, the uh, archivist or maybe one of my grandchildren might have some interest in uh, some firsthand information day by day uh, of the pandemic. If you're interested in following along, simply tell one of your Alexa devices, Alexa enable morning journal. And then each day, if you say, Alexa, what's new, then my flash briefing will appear. If you've got others like Reuters or BBC, different sources of news by flash briefing, they come in rotation. And uh, if you want to skip to the morning journal, you can just say Alexa next and go through them. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.